Hello everyone, thank you very much Mr. Bertalot. I am very happy to be here. And how well there you go. I am going to cover several themes a themes of my life, which is everything that makes up my life with the little extra thing which is the disability. And then well at the end of my speech, well I would be delighted to be able to answer your questions if you have any. Discui. So there you go. My name is Anne Sophie Santis, as Mr. Bertalot said. I am 41 years old, I am blind, so I was born with a total bilateral congenital cataract. Ah, uh, there you go. We did not find any cause of illness in my mother or anything that could have explained this. It is simply a bad stroke of fate uh, but that my parents accepted and uh, they fought like lions to be able also uh, there you go to do what I have become today. Ah, uh, I had poor vision for 20 years. I was visually impaired. I could see about a little bit out of my right eye and nothing at all out of my left eye. So I had mega big glasses and I had magnifying glasses to go to school. I get around without a white cane. Well, it was getting a bit awkward at the end, but I did it. I did my shopping alone. I watched TV. I was glued to the TV but I watched it. I saw it. Ah, uh, well, I, we had adapted a bit. It was a severe embliopia but I managed without the cane. And then at the age of 20, well, I had developed a very virulent glaucoma after this congenital cataract for which I had a lot of treatment and surgery for 20 years. More than 30 surgeries, first here in Clauderier where I spent every Wednesday and then in Paris. Ah and then well, there was an operation that went badly, I was 20 years old and then I completely lost my sight suddenly following this operation. So there you go, I had to relearn how to live after that. Ah uh, but that didn't stop me from becoming a physiotherapist which I have been since now since 2007. So that's ya yeah, 17 uh, I'm also married and I have two children aged 15 and 9 uh, who see perfectly well uh, because well so the disorder was congenital and so luckily I can't pass it on to my children and that was still very important. And beyond all that. I am also a high-level athlete as Mr. Bertalot told you in cycling. So, I wanted to first talk to you a little bit about my schooling, schooling and disability. So, well, I think I'm going to repeat this 15,000 times during my speech, but it's thanks to my parents because I was born in 1983, so at the time, children with disabilities were not tried to be integrated into a mainstream environment. Um. They were educated in specialized establishments. So, that's what was supposed to happen to me. And then, well, there you go. My mother was a bit of a pain in the neck. She was a bit opposed to that and she was right. Um, and so, they fought so that I could be enrolled in my village school. So I was born in Bois Grenier. It's on the web. It's not very far from here. So I was lucky enough to be educated with my friends at the village nursery and primary school. But, well, I still had a significant visual deficit. I never knew how to read on the board and so, well, my parents went to knock on the door of the Institute for Young Blind People in Lille, and they were so peered that the Institute gave in a bit and not only agreed to send me to a mainstream school, but they created the Integrated Children's Department for me. I was the first child in 1990 to have been able to benefit from an integration service in a mainstream school. Now it seems the norm but it wasn't at all. So that, well, that was incredible. So I had an institute that came every week to start teaching me braille to bring me back to school so that the teachers didn't have to do that and she came to make sure that everything was going well in my schooling. So that rhythm, well, it was kept up until high school. I then joined the Bocanlini St. Marie College. The challenge was to find a team of teachers who were sufficiently invested and willing to continue my integration. And we managed to do that until the end of the second year.
So, I went to the school for young blind people in Lille every week for computer science and braille, and then I was at Boken, and it was going well at middle school with always the magnifications, the teachers who made an effort to describe because I couldn't see on the board, but it was going pretty well, and then it got stuck at the end of the second year, it got stuck when I arrived at high school because while there at high school, the atmosphere was much bigger, a big team of teachers, a teachers who clearly didn't want to make any more effort, and that got stuck, there it was, the machine jammed in my first year of L, and then suddenly my parents, uh, had no choice but to go and knock on the door of the IG saying that it was stuck. And then at the time the Institute for Young Blind People in Lille did not have the funding to continue to integrate me at the high school level in the Nordpac Calais region. They explained that they did not have any other students capable of continuing in an ordinary high school with a visual impairment and so I reluctantly had to leave my family and friends to go to Paris. I was 15 years old at the National Institute for Young Blind People in Paris, which was at the time the only establishment capable of providing for my needs in terms of compensating for the disability and of giving me a general baccalaureate since that was my wish and that I had the ability to do so. So thank you Paris anyway because without this school, I would not have been able to get my general baccalaureate. It was very hard to leave with my back to Paris. It was not a choice, it was forced so it was complicated years for me. But it was still years during which I managed to switch to IT. So I had a 72 font on the screen, so it was about 3 letters per screen, but that's okay. Ah, uh, that was really it, but it kept me from being glued to the screen. I had the braille when I was exhausted and then for subjects that were a bit hot, like maths or physics, well I still had my pencil and paper. So basically, it was more comfortable, apart from the fact that I found myself in an environment that I didn't know, the boarding school, children who had clearly been less lucky than me in their lives, who were less surrounded, who were less motivated than me. And so, the shock, it was still a bit complicated to deal with. Ah, uh, I remember that I tended to call my parents bourgeois when I came home on the weekend because I was a bit lost between my golden cage at Boken and my little village on the webs and Parisian life in a public establishment during the week. So that was a little complicated and then I was able to get my general baccalaureate and join the physiotherapy school. So you should know that in France there are four physiotherapy schools for the visually impaired. There are two in Paris one in Limoges and one in Lyon because physiotherapy is a profession that is completely accessible with blindness since it is a profession based on feeling, clinical practice and a lot of touch. And so, I was able to join one of these Parisian schools. Ah and then unfortunately, it was in my first year of physiotherapy that I completely lost my sight. So there you go, I had to put my studies on hold, the time to recover, to digest and to adapt. Ah uh, and then when I regained my sight, the school without seeing at all, I was confronted with the problem of integration into the internship sites and that was my first experiences. Hospital and it was already very complicated times for me. Ah, uh, I had to go and find the internship locations in advance. Ah, uh, I had to, I had to, I was able to be an intern with blindness and it was a big, big, big ordeal for me. But hey, with my determination, my tenacity and the fact that I really wanted to do this job. So, we started to be able to get around things, to reassure people, to adapt and I was able to get my diploma in 2007. So for me, working in the hospital was more than a wish, it was really, I couldn't imagine my job as a physiotherapist anywhere other than in the hospital. I don't really know why. Maybe it's because I was very young, uh, but I think we are incredibly lucky to be able to be there for everyone, for all types of patients. I've always been fascinated by the acute. I've always been uh, fascinated by the fact that we met lots of people who could teach us things every day and I couldn't imagine working elsewhere. 
so it wasn't the easiest choice. For me because well, visually impaired physiotherapists are still a lot in the office since the patients come to them and consequently there aren't all these limits of movement uh, and adaptation uh, in the field. Uh, but for me it was my choice and I really wanted to take on this challenge. Uh, so I started to apply. Well there uh, it was really at the beginning. I came up against walls, huh? My first interview, I was told that a white cane and a white coat were not compatible. Ah uh, there, they told me they told me there. I really suffered a lot of refusals. I had to hang on, but I was so motivated by it and I said to myself, you have to convince people and if they let you prove yourself, it will go well. But they had to open the door for me at the beginning and that was not a given. But I still managed to find a sympathetic ear at the Torcoin Hospital. I worked there between 2007 and 2015 and there, I was able to familiarize myself with the hospital, reassure myself, after having reassured the others of course, but I was able to flourish there and show that well I had the same abilities as my colleagues with their eyes and that for the very small things that required adaptations, well there were soils and that for the tiny, tiny percentage of things that could not be adapted, well all I was missing was eyes and not a brain and that there were, well, there were people who were who were there and that alongside that, I also had rights, in particular the right to have a taxi to take me to and from work so that I would save myself some fatigue and also the right to specialized equipment. Like a PC with voice synthesis to allow me to fill out files and make transmissions in particular. So there you have it, Torcoin is the first establishment that opened its door to me. Ah uh, then, with my experience in Torcoin, I decided to ask for my transfer to Rube because I was offered to take charge of the pediatric department of the SC in adult intensive care. And these were the two passions of my life in the world of work, intensive care and pediatrics. And I was able to really work during these four years in the two sectors that I love the most, namely pediatrics and intensive care. And then well, with my 11 years of hospital experience, I was lucky enough to be admitted to the CHU in 2018. So there, I knew that I was tackling something big, EH. A very large establishment where there would be a lot of people and then I was going to be able to work in the department that I had always dreamed of, namely pediatric intensive care. I, I know that even if I didn't see them, at that moment, there were a lot of looks on me, a lot of questions and that's completely legitimate. But things happened quite naturally, so to speak. And then I was able to prove what I knew how to do, to reassure. It took a lot of talking, reassuring, and then when I was discouraged or when I came home tired, I was always lucky to have this entourage, that's who comforted me and who had confidence in me and who told me not to give up, and that I was going to be able to flourish. And I, I, I managed to do it and I'm very, very happy today to be Anso Lakine and not Anso Lilakine Avugal. The only thing that sets me apart from my colleagues is this cane that I use to get around because this cane, well, it's my eyes. Ah, uh, that's what allows me to not get hurt and to indicate to people that I don't see them coming in front of me. Ah, uh, but beyond that, when I'm in my rooms, I don't feel any limits. I quickly become familiar with my patient's environment. I know the rooms like the back of my hand. I have applications on my smartphone that allow me to scan the screens of the respirators or the scope. And I also think that my experience as a patient has given me a certain maturity, a certain empathy and it makes the dialogues that I can have with the parents and the children and the caregivers in the department a little easier. And I always get up extremely happy in the morning to come to work in intensive care and I realize how lucky I am every day and for me it's a challenge every day.
Because while I know that the disability is there and I know that it is also human and that if anything harmful happens in the service or elsewhere in the walls of Jean, the shortcut with my disability will be made automatically and I say it with great sincerity and I understand it completely but it is true that consequently I give myself less the right to make mistakes than someone who does not have a disability. I have always considered that it was up to me to make the effort to adapt and not to the outside world to adapt. And that is what I strive to do every day. But there you go, I have a demanding job and I have to be hyper-focused in what I do and I do not give myself any right to make mistakes in. I would even say that there you go, I have a level of requirement with me which is which is important, but it is the price to pay to be able, I think, to evolve in an ordinary environment with a disability. The world of work can be very violent and very hard when you have a disability and I think that's the price to pay. I don't like it. Ah uh, that's the reality but in any case it's going very very well and I'm delighted and I hope it will last a very long time. So at the same time, while I don't like to stay too static in my life, I don't really like to be satisfied with what I have. I think that you have to question yourself all the time. I think that you have to be curious, I think that you have to inform yourself, train yourself. Ah uh, and there you go, I have I have I there you go I have I always want to push the limits a little bit and to set the bar a little bit higher because I think that well life is magnificent and that it goes by very quickly and that we have lots of opportunities to do sublime things for ourselves or especially for others. And here in this case in a healthcare profession, we do it for our patients to improve the quality of care, ah, uh, that we offer to patients and I think that we have lots of opportunities. So in 2021, I did a master's too in research because it's an area that fascinates me also because I find that research in France in physiotherapy is a little hollow and I think that we have things to put in place. I would like us to be able to reflect on some of our practices, to question their positive impact or not. Ah, uh, are we doing well? Are we not doing well? Always questioning ourselves, that seems very important to me. So I did this master's degree with the aim of being trained to be able to set up research protocols. I am lucky in pediatric intensive care to work with a team that is very supportive of this. Ah uh, and ah uh, it was also for me the master's degree of the opportunity to discover the world of the faculty. A valid world that I had not apprehended. Well, I was not disappointed with the trip, ah, uh, because there is a lot of work in terms of integration and adaptation. Ah, uh, but ah, uh, once again, with the strength of my entourage, I was able to get my master's degree, write a dissertation and always adapt the appropriate level and that is really the basis for me, ah. Uh, and I would also like to be able to teach in the future. Ah, uh, that would make me very happy. I love to pass on knowledge, I love to pass on knowledge to students. I think that they are the physiotherapists of tomorrow and that we need to make them want to come and work at the hospital. We need to create vocations and I think that there is, there is, there is really something to do and we just need to make them want to end. I would also like to go and train them in schools and show them that we also need physiotherapists in hospitals and that it is truly an incredible job and that feeling useful on a daily basis and leaving work with the feeling of having done a service, of having helped others and of having brought things to others, well there is nothing more important. So there you go, when I have the opportunity, I would really like to be able to teach. So that will be yet another challenge, teaching without seeing your audience, but that doesn't worry me too much with my other senses, I think I would be quite capable of capturing their possible lack of attention. Ah, uh, as I told you in the introduction, I have two little boys and I wanted to share this with you a little bit because we are in a pediatric hospital where there is also a maternity and a neonate. And it seemed interesting to me to give a little update on parenthood and disability. 
So as I introduced it, I said that I said that it was the biggest challenge of my life and it's the truth because when we decide to become a mother, well it doesn't just concern us but it concerns others. And I told myself that maybe I didn't have the right to that because well my my future children didn't necessarily deserve to have a mother who couldn't see. Ah uh, and then ah uh, there you go, we had it was really a very strong desire for me. And I, I told myself that it must surely be possible uh, and that I had the right to that and that I thought I could make my children happy even without sight. But for me, it was something ah uh, there you go that really represented a real challenge. And so I did a little research and I realized that in Paris it's not I'm not Parisian but it's the reality uh, there was a puriculture institute in the 14th arrondissement in which there was a department of parenting assistance for parents with disabilities. So it's not necessarily visual impairment, it can be motor impairment and there is even a maternity ward with staff trained to support parents with disabilities after childbirth. So, we went there several times with my husband and I met wonderful people who first reassured me by telling me that I was perfectly capable of being a good mother, that my baby would be safe with me and she told me text, he would even be safer with me than someone who had all their senses because I had to be fully focused on my child and that I was not going to leave him vegetating at the changing table to go get something. Also they reassured me, they then guided me and they made me invest in equipment adapted to my blindness, in particular a talking thermometer to monitor the bath. Ah the baby bottles, it seems really simple, but filling them with a syringe since you can't see the graduations on the bottle. So we fill the bottles with a syringe to count. Ah they also trained me a lot in carrying so that I could keep my hands free since with a baby ah in my arms, it was no longer possible. Ah uh, but they also warned me about things that I could never do like for example it had marked me at the time, I told myself I would never be able to cut my children's nails. Ah, uh, there is something that I couldn't do either, it was take them for a walk in a stroller since I can't decently have my white cane and push the stroller. And so those were things, well, I had been warned that I wouldn't be able to do them but ah uh, it went pretty well. And it's true that this puriculture institute and being able to meet people with this expertise, it really gave me confidence in myself and it allowed me to approach the pregnancy much more serenely. Ah it was still very very complicated when my eldest son arrived because a baby communicates a lot with their eyes, they don't talk in me without sight, I sometimes had the impression of not understanding this baby and it was extremely painful for me. I tended to fixate on what I couldn't do with this baby and there were still a few weeks of somewhat complicated organization. I suffered enormously from not being able to go out more because when you have a crying baby, sometimes you get some air, you want to get some air, you put him in the car and then you go for a walk. For me, those were things that I couldn't do. So once again, the entourage Ben is very important because we need help. I always say that with blindness, I am autonomous and I am not completely independent and one of the things I cannot do is drive. So we still need to have a solid entourage and that is and it is one of my strengths and it is my great luck. But then there you go, blind mother is a bit like being blind or a blind woman. You simply have to adapt, compensate and organize. So it requires a lot of organization, anticipation. There is not much room for improvisation, ah, but it is going really well. We managed to adapt things at home on things, very basic adaptations and then uh, after that we adapted at any age. We had to first reassure the nursery staff, then reassure the school staff and then well now they are big, they talk and then well they have to instinctively adapt their gestures and their way of doing things to blindness. Ah uh, when they give me something, they take my hand, they put it in my hand. When my little nine-year-old son wants me to touch a drawing, he takes my hand, he makes me touch the outlines of his drawing, they have instinctively adapted to blindness, it is not in the chapter at home. They are aware that I will not be able to take them in the car. They are aware of my limits, but they are also aware of everything we manage to do as a family.
and it is no longer an issue, it is like at work, it is there but without being there. Ah but it's true that I'm lucky, my husband sees and of course that there are things that I don't do ah and consequently, well there you go, we need to have a solid entourage but with good anticipation and great organization, it's entirely possible. But like at work, I don't give myself any right to make mistakes as a mother. I think that if I put a white sock and a red sock on my little boy, well the shortcut with him being disabled would be made. If an able-bodied mother does it, we're going to make fun of her, we're going to tell ourselves that she's not awake. But I always told myself that people would hang on to my disability. And so, it's true that I also give myself as a mother little right to make mistakes at this level because well there you go, it's not it's not it's not always easy and you have to know how to deal with it on a daily basis. So, I wanted to talk to you about this word, this word resilience which is a little bit, I find, used sometimes in a good way and sometimes a little wrongly, but it's a word that speaks to me a lot because I think that we can't be happy in our lives if we don't have this quality. So for me, resilience, well, it involves accepting, doing the job, accepting the situation. I lost my sight suddenly and I had really complicated weeks and months ago where I told myself that I would never be able to do anything on my own again, where I told myself that it wasn't worth it anymore, where I told myself that there you go, I won't be able to move with my cane, where we set limits above all. And then there comes a time, I think that the choice is binary. Either we can continue like this to be angry at everything and anything and not do the job of accepting to digest and stay and remain frustrated and miss out on our life, or we decide to try to live it, and I decided to live it as best as possible and then we start to enter a virtuous circle again, and then we realize that yes, it is hard to move around with a cane, but that with hard work and repetition, it is possible and that we have the right to have a job, we have the right to have a job that we like, we have the right to have a family. So of course, it requires a lot of energy and maybe a little more courage than when we have all our senses, but it is entirely possible and I think that I think that it is really a choice that we have within us to get up, to move forward or to remain static, but it goes through very heavy learning. So that is valid for everything. It's a relearning, it means failing, trying again, starting again, getting up. Dealing, trying again. It's valid at work, it's valid in all areas. But I think that there you go, life is magnificent and it offers us lots of opportunities and we can really live with it, even if well there you go, even if it's hard and even if sometimes we're discouraged, but ah but it's possible and I think that you have to be an actor in that and not wait for things to happen. Out of nowhere, I think that you also have to be an actor in your happiness. I think that happiness can't be expected, it's going to be sought. It can be found when you want to find it and when you give yourself the means especially to go and get it. So, I come to sport which is the last facet a little bit of my life. Sport, a necessity, because well to deal with all that, there is still a small downside, it's that I think that sometimes, I'm maybe a little bit too nervous, a little bit too angry, ah uh, and that we have to take a lot of things, ah uh, that we also have to take well there it is sometimes the ignorance and sometimes the stupidity of people too, it must be said, ah uh, by my acquaintances often, and that suddenly well we still need a way to get all that out. Sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's irritation, sometimes it's feelings of injustice. In any case, we need an outlet. And handicap or not, I think that we all need to uh, to evacuate ah uh, from time to time. And so for me, it's sport that has given me that since a young age. It's really a crutch for me. It's a real second wind, it's a necessity. Ah, uh, when I left for Paris at 15, I was, 
Uh, very unwell and I was lucky enough to be able to get into climbing and climbing really helped me get through those high school years where I was far from my friends and family and where I had a disgusting canteen morning, noon and night. Ah uh, and ah uh, and actually climbing was a revelation for me and it helped me hold on and I won several national titles in climbing. So I first distinguished myself in climbing. At the time, I had bad eyesight. I continued to do it even though I couldn't see at all. So sometimes, it was funny because well, the instructor had to shout out the way to the holds at the bottom so that I would take the right colors. But it started with climbing. Then, I turned to para-athletics. I started running, running a lot. I was lucky enough to find a club with a handort label in Ville minus 9 U Dask and I won several French indoor and outdoor champion titles in the 800 meters and 1500 meters and I also did a lot of 5 and 10 kilometers in the region. And then from 2021, I obtained my status as a high level athlete and I have the French paracycling team. So you're going to tell me anything, climbing, athletics and paracycling, nothing to do with it. In fact, cycling has always been huge for me. I've always done a lot of it. So, when I had poor eyesight as a child, I did it. Well, I think sometimes it was a bit silly but I did it on my own on the web. When I lost my sight, they very quickly bought me a tandem because for me, cycling has always been synonymous with freedom. Outdoors, speed, thrills and also physical exercise. And so, I had never completely given up cycling. And then, uh, with my experiences in para-athletics, I was put through, I was approached at the level of the paracycling selectors, uh, I was approached, I was put through tests, we saw that I was up to the challenges and so I was, I was included in the French paracycling team in 2021. So for cycling, well there is no secret. Yeah. With my blindness, I can't do it alone, so I ride in tandem. So that requires having a pilot at the front. So my pilot was Ellis Delzen between 2021 and the Paralympic Games. And so we started to ride together a lot in 2021. And in 2022, we won the French champion titles, so on the track and on the road. We also got them in 2023 and 2024. So that was already a bit of a track record and we knew that we were in the running and that we were at least the best on the national territory, but we didn't really know how we were going to do internationally. In 2022, there were our first world track championships in St. Quentin and Eveline and we got two bronze medals. So a bronze medal in a team with a men's tandem in a sprint event and for us, the medal that had the most value at that level, a bronze medal in the pursuit, which was our event since we both had more endurance cycling profiles. So on the track, that translates into the pursuit event. Ah and so we obtained a two bronze medal champion titles so in 2022. And so from the moment we started to have world titles and well the machine was able to accelerate. We were able to be registered on the ministerial E in 2023. This resulted in rights, in particular the rights to the famous professional secondment with suddenly the Chu which was kind enough to second me so that I could increase my training load and participate in more competitions financially compensated by the Ministry of Sports. Small parenthesis. And so there you go, that's the one that's something that is allowed when you have the status of a high-level athlete. I was also able to start to get sponsors, partners, machines and the machine, it got a bit carried away at that level, but suddenly the demands of the staff as well. So, it was important to understand that 2022, 2023, 2024, there is a training load of between 15 and 20 hours a week plus work, plus home, plus the boys. So, it's true that these are timetables, a bit tight. All a typical week, well it's two weight training sessions per week. In the evening after work, it's training on a home trainer every day. On Thursday afternoon, it was a big four-hour road trip with my driver Elise and it was two by three hours on the weekend and then afterwards there were a lot of training courses and competitions. So in 2023, we won several international medals.
We won bronze and silver in the World Cup round, so on the road, all on the time trial and the road race. So in Italy, in the United States and the best medal in 2000-23 was a bronze medal at the World Championship. All it was in Glasgow and it was on the time trial. And there, it's the most beautiful medal because it's there that we are selected ah for the Paralympic Games in Paris ah thanks to this medal in the World Championship ah on this event which I think is the worst event that we can imagine on the bike. This time trial, for those who don't know, it's a distance of about 30 kilometers to more than 45 in our case. So that is to say that we are really at very high intensity for between 30 and 40 minutes of effort. And it's true that often well these events require surpassing oneself and going beyond the pain and the limits that we can push quite quite intensely. So it's true that when we got this selection it was uh it was it was really incredible and it's the fruit of all these hours and hours of work spent on the bike in addition to work. So it's true that it's huge to see that we are rewarded when we work. Afterwards, it's like everything, it's a lot of work, a lot of rehearsals ah and ah and ah a lot of here sometimes you have to push yourself well you have to you have to listen to yourself we don't listen to yourself too much. And so in 2024 ah there was the famous so selection for the Paralympic Games. And so I had the enormous luck and the happiness well to be able to experience these games because well they were games at home and that and that we experienced something absolutely incredible. So it was at the end of August beginning of September. Ah I was the first skeptic about the fervor around these Paralympic games. We knew that the Jew had been a real success. We had doubts about the Paralympic Games and in fact it was it was incredible. So we were lined up for three events, the track pursuit and the road on the time trial and the road race. So unfortunately ah uh, the pursuit so on the track ah uh, and well ah uh, it unfortunately didn't go well since we were disqualified ah uh, from our event. Ah uh, there you go, it was extremely hard to recover from it. It was really 48 he terrible ah there you go, we really experienced something very hard. We were proven we were deprived of showing what we could do on the track and it was really complicated and the challenge was to get back up and we managed to do it since on the road, we finished fourth in the time trial. We came behind our favorite competitors, the English and the Irish. We knew that to do something on the road, a medal, our English and Irish competitors would have had to fall or have a mechanical failure, that didn't happen. And so we are in our place, we are in our place on the time trial. Ah uh, and frankly, ah uh, yes, of course, when you are a fourth competitor, it's annoying because you're just off the podium, but there you go, knowing the level, knowing the disappointment, the slap we had taken two days before, ah, uh, we were happy to be in the top five, because okay, fourth, we don't have a podium, but hey, it still shows that we're a bit in the game, ah, uh, at the international level and so, ah, uh, there was disappointment, but there was also relief to have done a good time trial and an ah uh, and to be in and to be in the game. And then we finish with the road race two days later where we finished fifth. So there, it's the same, we have a mechanical problem, we go off the rails while trying to attack to finish fourth. So, there are some who tell you, yeah, but 4-5 doesn't change anything. Well, still, 5 is not as good as 4. So it would have been pretty nice if we didn't go off the rails but ah uh, unfortunately we can't go back on it. So these games for me, well they are tinted. It was a chance and a waking dream, an enchanted interlude to experience that. We're not used to racing into sport with full velodromes around us or full sidewalks. Ah, uh, I did the World Championships in 2022 in the same velodrome. The velodrome was in Carplan and there were 4,000 people screaming as soon as France was on the track.
It was something that really got your hair on your back and we were really incredibly pampered by the volunteers. Even the police officers, they had smiles. It was really a crazy experience. So I was lucky enough to experience the closing. I didn't experience the opening because we had the track the next day and when you're a cyclist, you're not allowed to stay on your legs while competing. On the other hand, I experienced the closing in the Stade de France and it was the same, we experienced something crazy. It was a nightclub version 10,000% a doo people. The stadium was full. Ah oh well, only Macron was booed at the start of the CL but a uh, stange, he was cheered and afterwards we really experienced a closing day, an incredible closing day. So for me, there are similarities between high-level sport and the world of work. Common values, that seems obvious to me. So already communication, me and my tandem by the way, that's what cost us our disqualification in the game because we didn't get along, you see. And in fact communication is super important. If I don't tell my pilot that things aren't going well, that I'm not well, that I didn't understand her information, that we don't exchange, that we don't debrief our sessions afterwards, that we don't anticipate, that we don't talk about our sessions before. And beyond that, if we leave without a common objective for our event, well it's doomed to failure. And I think it's the same at work. I think we evolve in a huge structure and we don't talk to each other enough. We see it every day, we talk about communication, by default of communication. Well there are, there are, there are, there are, there are dysfunctions. And I think it's important to talk about communicating at work between us, between colleagues, of course, but between departments and especially between the inside and outside of the hospital too, because there you go, the care is delivered at the hospital, but there is also care outside, and we have to go and make this connection. The second value that seems important to me is cohesion. Same in high-level sport, we are the French team. Uh, me too on my tandem, if we don't go in the same direction, I say it again, if we don't have the same objectives, ah uh, we don't move forward, and I think that at work, it's the same thing. We absolutely have to be united in our departments, that we have the same desires, that we go towards the same things. Ah uh, it seems to me to be important to unite the teams and to go in the same direction. So yes, it still takes a dose of courage, I'm sorry. Also in sports, well yes, it takes courage because there, we go beyond the sport for fun and sometimes training in the rain or accepting to suffer and pushing our limits constantly, well it's difficult. And I think that yes, at work, well sometimes yes, it takes courage to get up. It takes courage to sometimes face others on a daily basis, it takes courage to take care of things that cut our arms before going back to the rooms sometimes, but there you go, you have to have courage everywhere. That's what life wants and I think that there you go, if we lack courage, we can miss out on magnificent things ah uh, and this value seems important to me and we have to be courageous in everyday life today. And fighting spirit, well yes, I think that whether it's high level sport, whether it's work or whether it's life, all of these are real battles. Ah uh, the notion of repetition is super important. Um, I often go to schools and I tell them that at their most humble level, even when they are 9 or 10 years old, I tell them that a bad grade is not serious. I tell them that the main thing is to accept the bad grade and in itself the bad grade is not serious at all. What is important is to get back to work, to take stock of what did not work, to continue to learn, to repeat, to integrate and the good grade, it will come. And that, it seems to me an essential value, it is that I think that we still tend to get discouraged quickly and to lose hope. And in fact, I am sure that no one is aware of these resources and things that seem like mountains to us. One day, can be learned and become achievable tomorrow if we want it and if we also accept it. Well, it does not work every time and we must not be afraid of failure. And the best part is getting back into high-level sport, there is no one fights every day for in the end few victories and a lot of failures and that is part of the game and you have to know how to take it, 
You have to know how to work it and the mind is worked like muscles. The brain is strengthened like muscles and it is important to keep the fighting spirit of Pervarai. So uh that is a bit of an educational part behind, it is sport for all because when I go to schools or in interventions, we now know the hyper-positive impact of sport especially. So yes, we know that it is good for health but it is also so good for morale. We know that we know that there you go, it brings a lot of things. We feel better when we move, we sleep better, so we age better, well obviously because we strengthen ourselves, so the joints suffer less. We are in better health. Physical activity is truly an alliance, an essential health ally. And I, I fight so that sport really makes a place in all lives. I think that we are happier when we do sport, we know it, when we do sport, the brain releases hormones, serotonin, endorphin. And suddenly, these are hormones of happiness, of pleasure and we know how much it impacts morale and mental health. When we do sport, well, we are also more courageous to face life. Ah, uh, it also allows us to free ourselves, to empty ourselves, to empty our heads. So there is still a challenge to be met, well for the younger generations. We work in pediatrics. We are increasingly confronted with children who are overweight, children who have diabetes and we know that we can completely get around it with physical activity, which must be a real ally. Ah, uh, and I think it is extremely important to raise awareness among children and the parents of children. There are hundreds of physical activities, sports. There is bound to be one that you like or that your children will like. Ah, uh, and then, well, teenagers, it is even more complicated to get them moving but it is the same, there is bound to be something that they will like and I think that we really have to fight against this sedation. Arity. Afterwards, I know what people are going to tell me, eh. No time, no courage. But then, in this case, think about it on a daily basis and simply well it can be basic things, it can be taking the stairs instead of taking the elevator. Ah, uh, it can be lots of things like that. Ah, uh, it could be trying to come by bike from time to time. Well, it's not easy here, it rains all the time. But still, ah, uh, you really have to try to get moving because, well, you see, life is more beautiful, ah, uh, with physical activity, ah, uh, and for our younger generations, we know that it's really a challenge. We have an incredible increase in chronic illnesses in adults and we know that if we move our young people, well, they will develop fewer when they are older. There you go. So to conclude, well yes, I'm going to preach for my parish. Ah, uh, I think that we don't have enough disabled workers in companies. I know that things are changing little by little. I think that ignorance is scary. I think that there are a lot of apprehensions that are linked to the fact that we don't communicate enough about disability, about what it causes. And I think that when human beings are afraid. There you go, he has defensive reactions. He defends himself, he is clumsy, even hurtful sometimes. But I think that when we take the step of communicating, I go a lot to schools and in fact the kids, they are incredible because when we ask them very basic questions, we answer them, okay, cool, and in Kassen here you go. And I think that if we communicate about our young generations, we will make them more empathetic adults, more open to others and more helpful to others. And ah uh, and I think that there you go, it can really constitute an added value for companies. These are people who are used to fighting, who are used to not having acquired anything in their life and who can really be great elements for work. I wanted to give a big big wink and thank the business space. Orientation of the Chua which allows me to benefit from my taxi to take me to the hospital in the morning and in the evening which also helped me in the process of obtaining a PC with a voice synthesizer.
Know that they exist within the Chu who do a job ah here as important and who are and who are there to support you and for you and to help you. Ah and I think that we really have to dare not to be afraid of the other there you go, welcome welcome difference and once again happiness at work, it's like in life, that's not expected. I think that it's going to be sought. I think that we are lucky to be surrounded by incredible, competent people, who can teach us lots of things. There are lots of possibilities. We can do lots of things and happiness there you go, you have to go seek it everywhere, every day and all the time. And it seems really basic, but I think that when you have the will, the tenacity and the desire, you can really move mountains. So, I would like to thank you for listening to me already, I would like to thank uh, my manager Pauline, my senior manager Evdana because she had concocted a magnificent return for me after the games and that this conference was born from there ah uh, and that well without her, I would not have been able to have my secondment and to be able to train and be selected for the games, even if I did not bring back a medal. My colleagues also because well without her, well she is the one who replaces me and it is they who make all this possible and I thank them, I thank them deeply. I would also like to thank the career orientation space ah uh, more broadly well Mr. Bertolot and Jean de Fland for having organized and having allowed me to speak in front of you and also the administration and all the people who allowed me to obtain this professional secondment. To be able to lead my life at work and my life as a top athlete. Thank you.